This morning we are starting a three-week series, a short series entitled Reach Out, Reach Out, and we are looking at how we need to depend on God as we reach out to those who do not yet follow Jesus Christ. As a church, we believe that one of the primary reasons for our existence, one of the primary reasons why we are in the world, why we are in Dar es Salaam, is because God wants to use us to reach out to those who are not yet following Jesus. That is a conviction, that is an absolute reality that we hold on to as God's tribe. Are we doing that as much as we could? Probably not. But we do believe that there is a lost and dying world, that there are people on their way to hell. And we have a place in God's plan we have a role in God's kingdom to reach out to those who do not follow Jesus Christ. And the reason that we are going to spend three Sundays looking at this topic is it's because it's at the very heart of who God is and what God wants to accomplish in us and through us. And perhaps you are already feeling uncomfortable because you're thinking, why do we have to keep going back to talking about reaching those who are not Christians? Because that's what God is all about. And we as a church need to be about what God is about. So this morning, we'll be looking at our needs to depend on God, our needs to depend on God as we try to do our part with boldness and with urgency to reach this world with words of eternal life, with the very good news of Jesus Christ. And we must start by looking at depending on God, because without God, we can do nothing. And we'll look at two questions. Question number one is, why must we depend on God? Why is it so important that God is put first if we are going to reach the non-Christian? And the second question is, well, now that we agree that we need to depend on God, well, how do we go about actually doing it? What does it look like to trust God to use me? Still there. To trust God to use me to reach the person that isn't following Christ. Let's begin with that first question. Why must we depend on God in the first place? Why can't we just do this in our own strength? And we have three main reasons. The first reason is this. We must depend on God because this is God's mission. It's not my mission primarily. It's not your mission. It's not the mission of our church. Ultimately, it is the mission of God Himself. And if we want to go and reach those who haven't been reached, then we need to depend on the one who has come up with that mission to do so. John 3.16 tells us that for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. 
Who loved the world? God. Who gave his son? God. Who is about wanting to redeem the world? God. Who wants to give eternal life? It's God. This mission is his. And if we are going to make any progress, any lasting impact, we have to say, God, we trust in you because this is about you. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus, who is 100% God and 100% man, he defies the mathematics of the classroom. He's fully God and he's fully man. This is what he says about himself. He says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Jesus was speaking to a short man by the name of Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus had climbed a tree to see Jesus. And Jesus says, Hey, Zacchaeus, come down. And who was Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. He was a wealthy man, and he would have been an absolute social outcast because tax collectors in that context were seen as working for the enemy and often using means that were dishonest and lacking integrity to collect tax of the people. And here is Jesus. He sees this man and he befriends him and he goes and spends time with Zacchaeus in his home to the point where people begin to say, look at Jesus. He is spending time with sinners. And Jesus responds by saying, listen, if you haven't understood the God of this world, if you haven't understood the God of the universe and what his mission is and what he has sent me as his son to do, the mission is to seek and to save the lost. That's what it's all about. Son of man, why did Jesus come? He came to seek and to save the lost. That is what the heartbeat of God is, my friends. In Matthew 28, it's called the Great Commission, verses 18 to 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is Jesus giving marching orders to his disciples. This is the commander-in-chief saying, this is what you are to be about. You are to be about going into the world and making disciples of all nations. You are to go and proclaim the gospel and teach the world to obey what I have minded. Dear friends, we need to come to a point where as a believer in Jesus Christ, where as a church reaching the lost, reaching the person who is not a follower of Jesus is actually something that we are completely convicted about. That it is an absolute priority about who I am as a follower of Jesus. The authority is of Jesus. He is the one saying go. Two thirds of God's name is go. In Romans chapter 1, the first verse, in many of Paul's letters, he would begin by introducing himself. And this is what he says when writing to the church in Rome Paul, the servant of Christ Jesus 
called to be an apostle set apart for the gospel of God. So here is Paul saying, listen, I am a servant. The work I am doing is Jesus' work. The gospel I am preaching is not my gospel, it is the gospel of God himself. Paul was very clear that the mission he was about was a mission that he had been brought into by God himself. This was Jesus calling Paul, Jesus authorizing Paul, Jesus empowering Paul and saying, hey, go and proclaim the gospel of God to a lost and broken world. It's his mission. And you know, when we understand that it is his mission, that should give us such courage. Because we have all of heaven behind us. We have all of God's resources backing us. We're not doing our own thing. Equally, it should bring us to a place of absolute reverence, of absolute urgency. If this is what the king of the universe is about, if this is what the creator is doing, and this is what he is calling us to do, I need to get behind that. It's God's mission. Secondly, we must depend on God because to reach those who are not following Jesus is our mission from God. You see, if it ends when it's God's mission, you can say, well, God is sovereign, He is in control, He is all powerful, He can do it on His own. Let, let go, let God. No, but it doesn't end there. It's not only God's mission, it's also your mission and my mission. It's our mission together with God. You see, dear friends, it is us who needs to lay down our lives. Jesus has already laid down his. It is us who need to get our priorities in place. It is us who need to make the sacrifices and the adjustments in our lives so that there are actually some people who don't know Jesus in our lives. The longer you are a Christian, if, um, if you were to draw, draw a graph between time as a Christian and number of non-Christian friends or number of non-Christians that you know, for many of us, that graph has a negative slope. Which means the longer I'm a Christian, the less non-Christians I know. I am surrounded more and more by Christians. And I have less and less relationship with non-Christians. That's not how to go about this mission. Front and center must be, I have non-Christian friends. Because that's the mission that God has called me to. We need to reorient our lives. We need to obey what God is calling us to. It is so comfortable and so good to spend all of our time with Christians. I get it. I love spending time with Christians. I love spending time with you guys. It's fantastic. But here's the thing. God says he has come for the lost. And God says you and I are to reach the lost. How do we do that if all we do is spend time with each other? But as we reach the lost, we, as we reach those who are not in Christ, we don't do it on our own. We don't do it in our own strength. And what does it mean that someone is lost? I mean, that sounds so negative, doesn't it? Person's lost. Well, when something is lost, it means it's in the wrong position. It's in the wrong place. Because when something is not lost, you know it was there and you can find it there. 
So when we say someone is lost, it means that in relation to God, they're in the wrong position. They're in the wrong place. They're not in the right relationship with God. And they need, out of love and compassion and grace, they need to be found. But we do this staying connected to God. We all do this in our own strength. In, in the Great Commission, Jesus said that he will be with us to the very end of the age. So Jesus is saying, go, but hey, don't go without me. I promise to be with you. I want you to stay connected to me. I want you to depend on me. I am with you. This is our mission together. Paul says that he is called to be an apostle. Who does the calling? Well, it's God. It starts with God. But when you get called to do something, that calling is something that you then own. It's like it becomes part of you. God called me, but man, this is, and you've probably heard a fellow Christ followers say something like, my calling is. And that's absolutely fine. Because you have so owned that thing that God has called you to, that it's my calling is. And the question is, when you answer that question, when you finish that sentence, my calling is, how does it finish? Yes, part of my calling is to be a husband. Part of my calling is to be a father. Uh, part of my calling is to um, be in, in, in academia. Part of my calling is to be in business, to be in medicine, to, uh, to serve in the community. But part of my calling must be I am here to reach those who are not of Jesus Christ. It must be part of the answer as well. Otherwise, we, we've missed it as Christians. Following in the footsteps of Christ is not for a distinct few who we call missionaries. We are all supposed to be missionaries. Every follower of Jesus is by definition, according to what we have read, is supposed to be a missionary because you are on mission to reach those who are not following Christ. In the Mission Impossible movies, Ethan Hunt, uh, played by Tom Cruise, he's told, your mission, should you choose to accept it? And then he's given this very, very difficult mission by the impossible mission force, the IMF. Your mission, should you choose to accept it? So the IMF, the impossible mission force, they're the ones that come up with the mission. So it starts with them, they're the authorizing agency, but make no mistake, they say to Tom Cruise, Ethan Hunt, your mission, you are the one who's going to fulfill this mission. And it's kind of the same thing with us and God. It's absolutely His mission, but He absolutely wants us to make it our mission. And as Ethan Hunt goes about his mission, he remains connected to the IMF throughout. Is that relationship, just as God wants us to have that relationship with Him. Thirdly, so we say, firstly, that we must depend on God because it's His mission. We must depend on Him because it's our mission, but it's actually coming from Him. And thirdly, we must depend on God because we need God's power. We need the power of God. Going back to uh, that opening chapter of Romans in verse 4, speaking of Jesus Christ, it says, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness 
by His resurrection from the dead. So Paul is saying to the Romans that Jesus Christ was declared to be the Son of God by His resurrection. The fact that death could not hold Jesus Christ confirmed, made a clear statement, a declaration that Jesus actually is the Son of God. And that resurrection from the dead was brought about by the power of the Holy Spirit. So if we are going to make any declarations about who Jesus is, if we are going to make any statements to those in our lives that don't know Christ, our families, our neighbors, our, our colleagues, our schoolmates, if there will be any statement around who Jesus is and what he has done, we need power. The same power that raised Christ from the dead, that is found in the Holy Spirit, that is the power that you and I need to be able to proclaim Jesus Christ. Without that power, we cannot do much. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, he told his disciples that they would receive power when the Holy Spirit came on them. Power to spread the gospel. So in Acts chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, this is what we see there. It says, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We need power. We need to have a conviction around the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Because part of the way that Jesus is with us to the end of the age, remember Jesus has gone to be at the right hand of the Father. One of the ways that Jesus is with us is by sending us the Holy Spirit, who comes to be our helper, to be our comforter, to empower us, to help us in this life, including in the work of reaching those who are not followers of Jesus. I often pray, Lord Holy Spirit, I need your power. If it's all about me and what I think and what I can do, we, we don't want that. Holy Spirit, we need your power. So moving on here to the second question, which is, so how do we actually depend on God? Because dependence is something that is expressed in very practical ways. For those of you who are parents, think of uh, your children, especially when they, they were younger. When they are hungry and they need food, their dependence is made very clear in very practical ways. Sometimes it's tears, sometimes it's frowning, sometimes it's this or that, but you will know they need something from you. And you as a parent will respond appropriately. And it's the same with God. There needs to be a practical aspect to this walking with God as we try to reach those who are not followers of Jesus. So firstly, and there's three things that I'd like us to touch on here in terms of, in terms of uh, depending on God. The first one is we depend on God through prayer. No surprises there. We depend on God through prayer. In Jonah chapter 2 verse 9, Jonah says, salvation belongs to you. 
And that's the truth. We can learn the Bible. We can go out and, and speak words from the Bible. We can go out and preach. But salvation, salvation belongs to hope. You and I will never save anyone. Only God can save someone. So if God is the one who does the saving, then we need to come to God and say, God, please help us. Help me to be an instrument in your hands. Empower me to be an instrument in your hands. Make me fruitful to be an instrument in your hands. Show me the way to be an instrument to reach that person. Show me who you want me to reach. We must be a people of prayer. <coughs> Salvation belongs to the Lord. We pray because praying gives us boldness. And this is not a boldness that is based on personality. There's some personality types that are just, just very bold. But this is a, a boldness that comes from God specifically for the purposes of reaching people with the message of Jesus Christ. And even if you are not naturally that person who's very bold, through the Holy Spirit, you can be that person who can reach others because God will enable you. In Acts chapter 4, in verse 31, Peter and John had just come from being questioned by the religious leaders. And they were actually told to stop speaking in the name of Jesus. So they go back to the wider group, and what happens there? Well, they start, they start praying. And they pray, and they pray. And then here in verse 31, we see what the end result of that praying was. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. It was in the context of a corporate prayer time when they had come together that the Holy Spirit and empowered them to go out and proclaim the gospel message with boldness. So I'm excited that we as men are getting back to praying together. We've, we've struggled to find a rhythm and make the office. But I'm trusting that one of the things that will happen is we will have more of the Holy Spirit in us to proclaim the gospel. Every Sunday, we meet at 8.30, and that's one of the reasons we've kept the, the English service at 9.30 and not moved it back to 9. One of the reasons is so that we can have a time of corporate prayer. We started announcing this a few weeks ago, that 8.30, everyone at God's tribe is welcome to come and pray. All of you are welcome to come and pray, because we need to be a praying church. There's a couple of ladies' prayer meetings. Ladies, thank you for being faithful in those times of prayer. We are going to reach those who do not know Christ. We need to pray. Prayer gives us boldness. Prayer leads to open doors for the gospel. In Paul's letter to Colossians in chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. So here is Paul in prison. But he's saying, through your prayers, the gospel will not be shattered. Through your prayers, although the door of this prison is shut to me, the door to somebody's heart 
will be open for the gospel to penetrate. Pray. Our praying leads to doors opening for the gospel to penetrate the hearts of men and women and children. And perhaps this morning you are sitting here and God is doing something in your heart because you haven't yet believed in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You may know about Jesus, you may have a religion of some form, but you haven't yet fully surrendered every aspect of your life to Jesus as Lord. My prayer, even as I was preparing this morning, in prayer was, Lord, open some hearts. Open the door to some hearts that your gospel would penetrate and people would be saved and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. We pray because praying gives us the right words. Still there in Colossians 4, it says that I may make it clear. Paul is he's mindful of the fact that there is a mystery to the gospel. He's mindful of the fact that when you say words like salvation and born again and redeemed and restored, it's like what do all those words mean? And we as Christians need to get better at explaining those things. And one of the ways that we get better at making the message of the gospel clear is when we pray, God will help us to make the message clear. Somehow, the Holy Spirit, God himself, comes alongside us, comes on the inside of us, and that message, which sounds like, no, 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 it becomes clear, and hearts are penetrated with the power of the gospel through prayer. And finally, we pray because there is a lot of work but the workers of the people. In Matthew chapter 9, this is what Jesus said. He said that the harvest is plenty. There is so much that can be done. We, uh, last week during the our five year celebration, that video, we saw Adrian give that picture of that ball of that tree there saying there's so much fruit, there's so much potential in the gospel. One of the things that needs to happen is there needs to be workers that go out into the harvest field. Now, I, I, I thought of workers as, you know, we, we need to bring more people from outside, and that's fine. We can bring more people from outside, but you know, there's also workers right here as well. There's workers right here who need to be mobilized. There's workers right here, including me, who need to be cut to the heart, that God needs to convict and say, hey, you are a worker, you go out and proclaim the gospel. You go out and reach your neighbor. You go out and reach this harvest field, this plentiful harvest field. And outside of prayer, outside of a move of God himself, that does not happen. So dear friends, shall we take prayer more seriously? When that call to men's prayer comes, when that call to praying on a Sunday comes, how does it affect your life? Well, someone else will be there. It's not really for you. A man that early on a Sunday, that early on a Saturday, my time, no? Secondly, we depend on God by listening to Him. Our relationship with God is both speaking to God as well as hearing. We, we are not that special, that big, that all we have to do is to speak to God. That's all God. We also need to get to a place where we listen. And, and God can, can, can act in our lives after we've prayed through, through circumstance, through events. But God also acts in our lives by speaking to us. He does speak to us. And there's a couple of ways that we see 
God speaking to us, especially God will speak to us through His Word. So this morning, the Word of God, which is a double-edged sword, which is living and active, which is enough for everything that we need for life and godliness, the Word of God is a perfect thing. I'm not trusting in my own ability. I am trusting that the very Word of God is doing something in your life and my life. My, my journey towards being part of uh, God's tribe church is intricately linked to the Word of God. I heard a preacher preach a message from a book in the Bible called Nehemiah, and the Word of God cut me. The Word of God did something so deep in me that it caused me to absolutely change every plan I had about my career, about my future, and say, I'm going back to Tanzania, and I want to be part of God's work there. Why? The Word of God. So God will speak to you through His Word. In times like this, in your own time, as you read the Word, the Word of God will change your life. It will give you direction. Love the Word of God. Crave it like nothing else. God will also speak through angels and the Holy Spirit. Oh, where did that come from? We're comfortable with, with, with the Word. Now you're talking about angels and the Holy Spirit. Well, let's turn to the book of Acts of the preaching in Samaria. Philip received instruction from both an angel and the Holy Spirit. And this instruction was so that he could preach to an Ethiopian official. This is what we read in Acts 8. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose away. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch. Next slide, please. A court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, was in charge of all the treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the Spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So here is Philip, he hears from an angel, and then he hears from the Spirit of God. Why? Because God wanted this Ethiopian to hear about Jesus Christ. And Philip gets into the chariot, and he explains to this Ethiopian that this is Jesus. And the Ethiopian comes to faith, and he gets baptized, and that's one of the ways in which the gospel comes to the continent of Africa. How? Through an angel and through the Holy Spirit. And in 2018, I want to be open to seeing angels. I want to be open to hearing from the Holy Spirit. We hear of, of Muslims in, in this day and age today who have encounters with angels. Who have encounters with, with God through angelic revelation. How is that? Is that something that God can still do to me? Absolutely. God speaks through visions. That's another way we hear from God, is through visions. Or, while in the city of Corinth, he had a vision. And by the time Paul saw this vision, he had experienced opposition to the gospel, but he had also experienced fruit in the gospel ministry that he was doing there. And this is what we read in Acts 18. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid one night in a vision. Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in the city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Oh, that God will speak to us in visions. Didn't he promise that in the book of Joel, which was repeated on the day of Pentecost, that he would give us visions and dreams, that we should be ready to hear from God through angels, through the Holy Spirit, through visions? And finally, 
We depend on God by stepping out in obedience. With all that we know about God's mission, with all that we know that it is our mission, we still have a choice to make. We can choose to act, or we can choose to do nothing. You see, in those Mission Impossible movies, Ethan Hunt is told, your mission should you choose to accept. And if Ethan Hunt doesn't accept the mission, there would be no movie. Unfortunately, he accepts, and we get a great movie. You see, dear friends, we can, we can decide to obey God, or we can decide to disobey God. God doesn't actually force us. We can decide that this really matters, or we can decide that actually there are some things that are more important than reaching those who are not for resources. And it can actually be really good things. It can be things like spending time with your family, things like your job and developing your talents, things like spending time with fellow Christians, these are excellent things. These are good things, and by all means, let's do them. But what about this other thing, reaching the non-Christian? You see, we can either ask the Holy Spirit for boldness, or we can give in to fear. We can be consumed by what God has said we must do, or we can be more concerned about what people think and what people say. After Jesus spoke, the apostles did preach in Jerusalem. They did preach. After Philip heard the angel and the Holy Spirit, he did share the good news with the Ethiopian. After Paul saw the vision of the Lord, did stay in the corridor and continue speaking the word of God. What's the common strand in all those three situations? Obedience. They heard and they obeyed. And it's the same for us today. We can hear and obey, or we can hear and say, that, you know, that message, oh, you know, oh, there's some interesting things there. Ah, oh, but. I have better things to do with my life on Monday morning. And their obedience led to fruit. Their obedience was an act of submission to the will of God, an act of trusting God for the lives of those God wanted to reach to them. And it led to fruit. Because in Jerusalem, multitudes came to know Jesus. Because the Ethiopian did come to faith in Christ. And we can safely assume that more people in Corinth came to know Jesus Christ. Stepping out in obedience is an act of faith on our part, and we leave the rest to God. As we come to an end, with this message. I want to read a quote. This is Charles Colson. And he said, What God wants from his people is obedience. No matter what the circumstances, no matter how unknown the outcome. I'll be the first to admit that I am struggling in this area of sharing the gospel with people who are not Christians. I wish I had some recent stories to tell you of people I have shared the gospel with that have become followers of Christ. I know it. And that should break my heart. I want to see that change in my life.